It's okay. Recording in progress. Okay. 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 Lou's got candy. Yay. We will let her go. Okay. Let me um let me start with prayer because otherwise nobody will be listening. <laughs> Not that anybody's going to listen to me anyway. Hello. Okay. We're going to start. All right. All right. I'm going to pray. Oh, dear Lord Jesus, we just praise you for your word. We praise you that your word is true. We praise you that um, you have given us a gift beyond what we can comprehend. And in this world that we live in that is dominated by evil and sadness and suffering and um, things that we despair of, you have rescued us. You have rescued us in a way we can't even understand because we're still here. And yet you want us to proclaim who you are to this world and to give your love to all these people that you have created. And so we just ask that you would put deep in our hearts these truths that you had Paul stand firm and, and speak forth and give to the Galatians and remind the Galatians who had come to you and yet were uh, deserting you and distorting and, and allowing people to distort your word. Lord, help us to know the truth of who you are, that we can see the distortions and that we might have such a love and such a faith that we would not desert you, but we would return to you and hold tight as we can to you as you hold even tighter to us. So Lord, I just ask that um, you would be with us today, speak your word and speak your hope and speak your life into us in Jesus name. Okay, so John Pollock wrote a book called A Foreign Devil in China. And it's a book about a missionary, um, Dr. Nelson Bell. He was a medical missionary in China years ago. He is actually the father of Ruth Bell Graham, Billy Graham's wife, and the father of Clayton Bell, who Dr. Clayton Bell, who was a, a past minister at Holland Park Presbyterian. Anyway, so Pollock tells this story um, about a man named Koa in the village where Dr. Bell was getting ready to minister. And um, so Koa had been a Chinese Confucius scholar until he became a Christian. And when he was converted to Christ, he told Dr. Bell this parable because he had followed Confucius so closely. He knew, I mean, he was on that track. He also, where they were in China, there was Buddhism, there was all sorts of um, witchcraft and, and all these things. I mean, they did all these incantations and stuff to you know, make life better for themselves. Um, so he just knew in his mind what all these religions were striving to do. And so he, he uh, maybe it was an ancient uh, parable that he already knew, or maybe he made it up. I, I, I honestly don't know that, but in the book it says, so this is his parable, uh, Koa's parable. So there was a man who fell into a dark, dirty, slimy pit, and he tried to climb out of the pit and he couldn't. So Confu Confucius comes along and he saw the man in the pit and he said, poor fellow, if he had listened to me, he would never have fallen into the pit. And so he walked away. And then Buddha came along 
And he looked down in the pit and he said, if he would climb out and listen to what I have to say and do what I tell him to do, he, he could come out of the pit, but he's got to climb out himself and then I can help him. And so he went on his way. And then Jesus Christ came and he saw the man in the pit. He said, poor fellow. And he jumped into the pit and he pulled the man out. And, and so Koa was just saying, he was describing, like I said, the difference between Christianity and really every other religion in the world, other religions and philosophies, even our scientific age tells us that we are smart enough to get ourselves out of this pit. Um, we just need instructions. We just need to know how. We are smart enough to, to get ourselves out. And most religions have a code of conduct to live by so that they can live morally. And it is Christianity alone that has this super, the, the, this supernatural power, has the resurrection life that we talked about so much in Acts, the resurrection life of Christ who raises us up to what we could otherwise not do. And that's only a part of what Jesus really accomplishes for us. So today we're gonna to look at how, what the Bible calls the gospel, which in Greek is euangelion. It's the good news. It's, it's good news. And we need to understand why it's a good news. It's because we're in that black slimy pit with no way out. And yet we have this supernatural God who loves us so much that he is willing to make a way to rescue us out of this pit. Um, so my outline, I, you know, I don't know. You, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta kind of pre, you, you, you kind of have to make a main point, but because God provides this rescue for us, we must not desert him. We tend to do that because I don't know why, but we do. Or we distort when people distort what he says and, and the truth of what he says. But we need to not distort it. But we must receive what God reveals to us. So with that in mind, um, last week we did an over overview of Galatians and we got the setting in the context so let's go back and kind of get back into the setting in the context who wrote Galatians and to whom did he write it and why and when so who wrote Galatians Paul Paul we just studied Acts and we know Paul so well and we just hopefully fall more and more in love with his zeal that has been turned from persecution to um, just wanting everyone to know this God who saves us, who rescues us. And who did he write to? The churches of the Galatia area. So it was like we, we read about, um, they, they call it Antioch uh, Pisidian. Um, here's our little map. Lyconia and um, no Lystra, Iconia and Derby, and those are the places. Those are the the churches. and And how many times did he did Paul go there? Three. Every the very first journey, the, his very first missionary journey was to this area. So this is a church close to his heart because they were. They probably weren't his first converts because, you know, he spent 15 years um, or, or years, you know, in the Damascus area. So, but, but these are his, his, his Gentile converts. Um, okay. So, all right. So we said, and then when, when did we decide he wrote this letter? 49, 50 AD. So it was, not that long after Christ, but it's been a while and it's really kind of halfway 
into his ministry. Um, we leave him, we left him in Acts 30 years out, but this is 15 years. So it's, we're kind of backing up just a little bit. And um, anyway, so that's where we are. That's our setting. And why did he write to this, these churches? He want he he loved them. Chris said he loved them, but he wants to point them back because because why? Right, but what what's happening? People are coming in. These Judaizers are coming in and telling them that the 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 gospel that that Paul gave them was not right. That they needed to add something to that. That these that you needed to be a Jew. You need to be circumcised. You needed to follow the laws of the Jewish people to be right with God, that they weren't doing, they needed to add to what Paul said. And so they're getting confused because it sounds good. And, and, and back to Confucius, we all want something to do. We want to do something for God. We love him and we want to do something for God. And so that just kind of comes natural to us. And so instead of sticking with God and just saying, you've done it, there's nothing I can do. They're kind of deserting God and they're saying, okay, well, maybe if I did get circumcised, that would be helpful or God would like me more or you know, maybe there's something I can do to help myself out of this pit. But you know what? There's no way for us to get out of the pit. So, um, so with, with that all in mind, with our context and with um, who he's talking to, um, we looked at chapter one. And do you remember my outline last week? Not that you have to, but it said that because only God has the power to say, we must believe the truth. And in chapter one, do you remember what truth we needed to, was, uh, we needed to hang on to? What truth was revealed? What truth is revealed in this first chapter? It, we, we hone in on the gospel and, and the gospel is there, 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 there. But what does the gospel reveal to us? The truth about God. The truth about God. The gospel, this good news, reveals the truth about who God is. And as we look deeper into chapter one, we are going to see this God that is worth um, not leaving. and not distorting his word, uh, a word, a God worth hanging on to. Um, okay, so as you looked at chapter one, there were kind of two truths that we've mentioned that, that Paul wanted to make very clear in chapter one. And what were those two truths? What does he say right out of the bat, right off the bat? Paul, what? An apostle. So what is he wanting these people to know that he's an apostle, that he has authority, that he didn't just choose himself. He didn't even, what does he say? He is an apostle, not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God, the father who raised him from the dead. What is Paul saying about Jesus and God in that statement? God raised him from the dead. He's alive. Okay, not from men. Yes, yes. Okay, so it's not through men, nor through God, and I mean, nor through man, but through Jesus. Was Jesus a man? He was a man. He was a man. And yet he was more than a man. He wasn't. So Paul is making a distinction that there are men and then there is Jesus. He's more than a man. He came and he became incarnate like us. And yet he was God. And that was huge for these, especially the Jewish audience, but even for the Gentiles to know that there was a God. They had all these gods that they 
believed in and worshipped and and did all they could to to get them to appease the, these gods that they had and yet there was a god who came and dwelled with them so that is huge okay so paul wants them to know that his authority came from god and what else did he he what what just repeated over and over ellen mentioned it the gospel the gospel he wanted them to know what about the gospel there's only one gospel that they're hearing all this other stuff and the gospel um is the good news that and, and it it is the good news about what god did and who god is so and there's really just one so he paul is just wanting from the get-go wanting to, them to know that he's got this authority and that there is really only one gospel. There's one truth. There's one truth to hold on and believe in. Um, okay, on page 27 of your homework, you listed um, what you learned about God and Jesus and grace. So you might wanna have that available as we go through all this. Um, to kind of look at it and, and be reminded. So um, all right. So verse one, we see I, I so one commentator said, you know, in this thought about Paul and how he sees Jesus more than just a man. Uh, Philip Ryken puts it that although Jesus was a man among men, Jesus is very God of very God. And, and, and once again, that just was a hard thing. It's a hard thing for us to grasp that God, if you really think about it, the God of the universe came and looked like us and, and was one of us. I mean, that's just like mind boggling, really, if you think about it. Okay, um, okay. So last week we talked about the significance of God raising Jesus from the dead. It says here, um, you know, Paul just, this is just his introduction that he says that Jesus Christ and he's an apostle, through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised Jesus from the dead. We, we talked about that. What is this resurrection? What does it mean that, or, or, or what does it imply that God raised Jesus from the dead? What's that telling us? That Jesus is God that Jesus is God, that God is witnessing to the fact, you know, we looked at John 8 and, and, and Jesus said, when you raise me up, when you put me on the cross and kill me, then God will witness to the fact that I am who I say I am. And um, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So here, here he's just bringing that back up. Paul's bringing that back up. Okay, and then in verse two, um, who is with Paul? We don't, we don't know them by name, all the brothers who are with me. Remember Paul? We, I mean, I just love Acts because Paul never traveled by himself. He loved to have buddies and he didn't just have one or two buddies usually. He had several buddies. So he's got this group of guys that are with him, you know, standing with him. So all the brothers who were with me to the churches, and then he's writing, and this is just, you know, dear, this is just how they start their letters. Um, but it, it says a lot. Um, okay, what does, what does Paul say in verse three? How does he start? Once again, this is kind of just like a salutation, but, but he said, it, it's, it's, he does it purposely. And what does he tell them? In verse three, grace to you. I'll tell you what he says. Grace to you and peace from God, our father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Um, why is he, why do you think he's telling that them, why is he saying grace and peace besides the fact that, you know, he's, they, have forgotten that. they have forgotten and they need peace because they are in turmoil because these people are troubling them. And so he's just reminding them grace and peace come from God. Uh, so he's just giving them that affirmation. Um, and they need to be reminded, we need to be reminded of God's grace and God's peace because we see things happening, the Ukraine, I mean, just all these things that we're just like, Lord, what in the heck is going on? And we need to know that we can walk in the peace of God because he's got it under control. He knows what's going on. This isn't like a surprise to him and he's going to come and try to fix it later, you know, later. He, he's, He's, he's up front and he knows what's going on. Um, okay. All right. I'm sorry. I've had this head cold, you know, and so my head is <laughs> sometimes in a cloud. Okay. So then we look at verses three through five and what do verses three through five say about the father and the son? Let me read them three through five grace to you and peace from God our father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and father to whom be glory forever and ever amen so what do we learn about Jesus in these verses that he gave himself for what okay so what does that say he gave himself how willingly he he was not put to death against his will he willingly went remember when he was um in front of uh whoever it was pharaoh or whatever and he said you know pharaoh's like i can take your life and Jesus is like, you know, you really can't, but I'm going to give it willingly. So it, it was his choice to do that. So, and why did he do it? Why did he do it? For us. To do what for us? To deliver us out of this evil, present evil age. And also for for our sins, for our sins. We couldn't get out of that slimy pit because of the sins we have, but God, but Jesus did this willingly for that very reason. Um, exactly, the law condemned, the law condemned. God is a just God and we sin, Adam and Eve sin and, and their sin caused what? Death. It caused death. And, and God can't just say, okay, now you're fine. I just, you know, I'm going to overlook the fact that you sin. It he's a just God. It had to be paid for. That sin had to be paid for. But he was willing to pay for it himself. Um, that's the good news. That God was willing to pay for our sins. And sometimes I think I don't take that in quite as much as I should that you know because it's so easy for us we're just like okay good you know yay I you know I don't I don't have to worry about my sins because Jesus paid for my sins and yet it was a mighty cost to him for that to happen okay and so Jesus says he gave himself to deliver us, and really that word deliver in Greek means to rescue us from the present evil age. And it was, how was it done? Jesus did it, what does it say? According to the will of God. According to the will of God. Let me see if I can find. Um, it wasn't like, it, it wasn't like Jesus just did it, but it was a planned thing. I was okay. trying to think of Jesus, I mean, it's wrong. Like, 
staying the hand of the father who wants to just crush us. You know, and like good guy, bad guy kind of like, oh, if it weren't for Jesus, God would be smashing down. Yeah. And then it's so transformational when we recognize it's the love of the father yeah, yeah, that sent the son. And they're so beautifully united that, of course, he was willing to go and do this. And it's the love of the father yeah. that sent the son. Exactly. It's not my, I'm, I'm crazy. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, so once again, Philip Ryken says, there could be no conflict within the Trinity, God, the Father, Jesus, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as if, like Ellen said, as if a loving son had to rescue us, this is exactly what you said, from an egg, you and Philip, or like, (laughs) Compatico. <laughs> okay, as if there was a loving son who had to rescue us from an angry father. You know, they're deserting the father because they're not realizing how much he loves them. Um, and I think we get that too. I mean, we're just, yeah. Okay, so I will try to finish this whole thing. There could be no conflict within the Trinity as if a loving son had to rescue us from an angry father. On the contrary, the willingness of the son was in response to the father's will. He wanted Jesus to do that because he loves us so much. The father does not love us because his son died for us. The father does not love us because Jesus died for us. Rather, The son died for us because God loves us. The cross had its origin origin in God's heart because he loves us. Um, Consider what the gospel says. It doesn't tell us what we have to do to please God. Instead, it announces what God has already that God is already pleased with us um, as pleased with us as he is with his own son. This liberates us from seeking the approval of others. At the same time, it frees us from striving for God's favor. We already have the tender affection of his eternal love. What more do we need? Nothing more, which is why The one true gospel is such amazing good news. Um, Okay, so as we go on, let me see if I'm missing anything. So so then he, uh, so that's just Paul's salutation. And and he starts this letter, usually in all his other letters, he kind of gives them an accommodation, or y'all doing good, or, you know, da-da-da-da-da, and he just jumps right in and starts telling him what, I am astonished that you all are so quickly deserting God, this God that loves him, them so much, who called you in the grace of Christ, in this unmerited uh, favor that he has through Christ and are turning to a different gospel. What what does Paul say about this gospel? They're turning to this different gospel. There is no, not that there is another gospel, not that there is another gospel, but there are some who trouble you. And we know these Judaizers are coming in and telling them they need to do more. They need to um, add to it's like it can't be that God could so easily save you um, and they're distorting they want to distort the gospel of Christ but what is what does Paul say but even if we or an angel from heaven would preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to we preach to you let him be accursed. Let him be, be damned. I mean, Paul is like serious. Yeah. He is serious. This is not, um, and, and he kind of, one, one commentator said, it's kind of a hyperbole because would angels ever, unless, I mean, if you're thinking fallen angels, but would an angel from heaven ever preach a gospel contrary to God? 
well, Satan, but, but if you're thinking of the good angels, they would not. They are messengers of God. They speak God's word. They wouldn't do that. But he just want, he's just letting them know that even if, even if we, now he's including, he starts out in eight, including, you know, the brothers, all the brothers who are with me. So even if we, or an angel from heaven, should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach, we preach to you, let him be damned. And then he says in nine, as we have said before, as we have said before, but now I am saying to you again. So now Paul's owning this. Now I say to you, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received. So what do we know about, you know, we don't know that Peter's with them, but even Barnabas, what happened with Barnabas uh, when these Judaizers were coming in and they were in Antioch? Do you remember what happened? Barnabas kind of took a little turn. He wasn't preaching another gospel, but he was living hypocritically and he was, you know, kind of disassociating with some of the Gentiles because these Judaizers were coming in and convincing them that, you know, maybe we aren't doing the right thing. And, and it's hard when, when, when men, influential men come in and try to talk you into, um, you know, just are saying things that sound good. Um, so anyway, so, so, so Paul is just kind of owning it and saying, um, that, that, that I, you know, he, he goes, I say it again, that anyone, anyone, Barnabas, Peter, James, any of those people who are influential or these influential Judaizers that are coming in that, that, you know, have, you think have been Christians or, you know, men for so long. And, and what is the warning to us? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And we need to be careful because, you know, we are relational people and, and we really kind of do honor people that know more than us and that is not a bad thing. And yet we have to be careful that we keep our eyes. That's why I love precepts is because you guys are looking at the word and you're seeing the word and you're learning the word and the Holy Spirit is teaching you and leading you so that you know the word. And even if somebody, I was told y'all the other day that I kept watching over the holiday, <laughs> these documentaries that were just horrifying because there were these prominent people that were teaching the gospel and people were following them along and these whole huge mega churches were going down for the count. I do believe God um, and, and, and Paul speaks to it here, but, but, um, but they were, they, they got caught up and they were seeing man and they were kind of de not deifying man, but, you know, lifting him up and saying, well, if he says it, it must be true. And yet anybody we talked to, even yeah. me, <laughs> yeah. You're responsible, and there's scripture about that. Exactly, right? exactly. And if I say something errant, which I could with my head cold and my um, drugs that I'm on. Um, <laughs> so really, I mean, I, check it out and believe what you know to be true and what you see to be true, uh, rather than what you think somebody, you know, else, I mean, knows. Well, we're all fallible, Lisa. Yeah. Be on alert because it's going to come from within. Within. Us. within. That's and the biggest. It. Right. Why. Yeah. And I think that's where we get a little, a little messed up. Right. Um, because we just aren't aware of it. Able to say exactly what that is, we know it's just slightly distorted. It's called twisting the truth. Yeah. It, it's people that we know, people who are believers. Exactly. And exactly. It's just a distortion. And it comes from, we can so easily stand against, you know, stuff from the outside of the church because, you know, that's easy to spot. I mean, we can do that 
easily, but it's when it's from within and not to be fearful. And yet you do need to kind of be careful because even good intending people get it wrong every once in a while. I mean, it just is, it's, it's, we get it wrong and we need to refocus and we need to, you know, you just are like, you need to, yeah, reset, reset. So he says, so he's telling them that those people are cursed. Uh, and then verse 10 says, for I am seeking for, for am I seeking the approval of man or of God? And is he? What is Paul seeking? He's all in for, for God. Yeah, Sylvia. Yeah, yeah, and, and so I love that because interestingly, I have my cousin, this cousin that I hardly know is staying with me, um, started Sunday, she, anyway, weird thing, but anyway, uh, and, and I am not, <laughs> I am not one to speak forth the gospel, you know, and speak forth my faith, and you know, I'm not bold in that, I, I don't know why, but, um, but I'm like, Lord, get over this you know because it's this am i trying to please man yes i am i am that's my goal in life to please man to please y'all make y'all like me you know whatever and and not say anything that people would think i'm a, a wacko about you know and and yet it's the truth and it's what i believe so anyway so Exactly. So we, what, that is a good, that's a good conviction of this. Denise? So number one, when I listen to God, there's a <laughs> and every single thing. And whenever anybody else, including the apostle, talk yes to me, God, and that's why, that's why he is so intent in, in letting them know that he is a, an apostle. We kind of take that, you know, apostle, and I really am, am, am at fault in this, that, oh, there can be apostles now. But truly, Jesus chose special men to send forth this gospel to begin with so that it would be a strong Truth that the people. Era right, the apostolic era is yeah. over. It's like the patriarchs. There were twelve patriarchs. Mm -hmm. Can't I mean God just chooses stuff. We and we get. Um, I'm reading through the Bible, you know, and uh, the people are coming up and telling Moses. Um, so who put you in charge anyway? You know, and they're questioning Aaron. They're questioning Moses, and you know we're all. God loves us all. So he's fine with all of us. And that's when, you know, Moses is like, oh my gosh, like I even want to be in this position. But, you know, and so they gather their little sticks together, the 12 sticks. And what does Aaron's stick do? It grows, it blossoms, it has almonds on it. I mean, it's a stick, it's not a tree. And, and, and God's like, I've chosen these people and I've chosen them for a purpose. And, and don't you all fight over it. I mean, it's ridiculous. I mean, I did it for a purpose and I've given them these words so that, that they can give them to you in truth so you can stand on them. They're my words. They're my words. They're not man's words. They're my words. Um, and so that's what Paul goes on to say. Okay, so 10, it says, am I seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. So that's where we need to get to is to be a servant of Christ and not worry about what man says or what they think. I mean, yeah, you do. What was Paul? You know, Paul, we saw him and he was trying to be a Jew to the Jews and a Gentile to the Gentiles. And he, 
he, it wasn't that he wanted to be offensive. He didn't come across offensive. He loved them. Uh, and yet he wasn't being driven by that. He knew the truth and he was holding to the truth. And that's what we need to do. And he says in 11, for all, I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me, Paul, the apostle who has authority, which they're questioning, is not man's gospel. Think about that. This is not man's gospel. This is not something somebody made up along the way. This isn't Confucius saying, oh, I think if we do this, that'll be, you know, live this moral life, you'll be good and you'll be accepted. It is God's gospel. He created it. I mean, back to that, you know, it was his will that Jesus willingly died for our sins. Um, it, was, it, it, was, it was the whole plan. This is God's deal. It's not something we made up. Um, okay. And then in verse 12, it says, for I did not receive from any man, nor was I taught it. And what is he talking about? The it? I didn't receive the gospel from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through what? The revelation of Jesus Christ. So, so God actually, I mean, Jesus on that road, Barbara, Sorry, that's okay. It just struck me all the time he read through this whole thing. Excuse me, he made that point. And then later he says that the, the, after a period in the wilderness of God, so Jerusalem, and I think he was talking about that. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and he got balanced. Yes. Yes. Was was lining up with, with what they they knew to be true. And really, yeah. Yeah. And I never I never saw that before, but at some point he was ready to go meet the other and and say, This is what I got. Exactly. Exactly. I think that's part of his point. It, it, it is I'm exactly the right. point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Right. yeah. It is actually, yeah, it is. Um, did y'all, I, I don't see any of you all out there, but. Like I did, that you do two tests and you get the same result. That, that provides you more. It's kind of, it's back to that witness. I mean, it's the witness that what you. Take off, you know, you're taking your proof from one test. There is a thing. So it just, it just. Yeah. I didn't have to hear them tell me. Yeah. Right. And too. Exactly. And, and it was the same thing. It was the same. It was the he same. Was Pardon me. He was being a Berean. He was being a Berean. He was, and and we don't know. Luke doesn't tell us what Paul did, or Paul didn't tell us what he did for those three years. Um, I don't know if I said this, but a woman in our night group said, you know, so so Paul spent these three years, uh, whatever he was doing with the old testament but jesus was there ministering to him somehow and and what was i mean you you just think jesus spent three years with whom the apostles that's how long he had his apostles that he made and so here he paul's just catching up with them uh so so he had those three years of of just learning what Jesus had to, to, you know, learning this truth that he wasn't taught it, but he received it. He received it through revelation of Jesus Christ. And then what were, we look at uh, verses 13 through 17. What all was that? What, what, is, what is 13 through 17? This is Paul's testimony. And we've heard it. Well, of course, we, we did Acts, so we've heard it three times. And now we're hearing it again, and we're going to we're going to actually look at it, but uh, so why is that important? Let me just read it to you. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently. And remember Ellen said, it's like Osama bin Laden or some, you know, violent person. I mean, it wasn't, he wasn't just a mamby-pamby, you know, uh, 
Jew. I mean, he was like reaching out and, and coming against these, these Christians, these people that have all of a sudden this new, I mean, he's these Judaizers. He was like a Judaizer to the 10th degree. I mean, he wasn't, he, he wasn't just going and telling him they needed to be circumcised and all that stuff. He was putting him in prison for that very thing. And, and watching Stephen being stoned and approving of that because yeah, you got to get rid of these people that have this crazy, crazy idea. Anyway. Okay. So, so that's what he was doing. He was, um, he persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So he was, he was young when he was doing all this. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. And that so many traditions had come up through the years um, that weren't even uh, God's total truth. So, so I think, you know, when he was holding the coats of the people, I, I pictured him as being like 10 or 11 years old. Oh, that, or, yeah, I don't know. Like I don't know. Years. Yeah, but he was he young. Was, yeah, was yeah, young. probably 13 or 14. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he, he approved of it. Right, but he wasn't one of the but ones. He wasn't, he wasn't old enough to be a stoner. Uh, yeah, yeah, good and, point, Carol. So I, you know, yeah, 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 too young to participate, and yet he was approving of it. Um, that I, don't, I can't verify that, but anyway, okay. So, 14 says, So, I was advancing in Judaism, you know, no, no. and then 15, but okay, and Ellen said this before it's when you see it, but God is when the good news comes, and but when God, it says he, but we know, I hope that but when God who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles I did not immediately consult with anyone nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. So what is he saying here? Didn't have to go to the apostles to the Yeah. Well, he, and, and you mentioned that that time apart, you know how Moses was praying to the desert. Yeah. And of course, all the things were accepted and he was still so doing. Mm -hmm. That's the same thing for Paul. I mean, he probably had seen Isaiah 53 his whole life. Yes. I had a clue what it meant. And all of a sudden he's like, that's what this is about. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and don't you know that Betty, I love that. Did you all hear it? You, Betty was just saying, you know, Paul probably read Isaiah 53 his whole life. And then all of a sudden, with when when God is revealing Jesus to him, he's seeing Jesus in those very words, in those very words. Um, don't get mad me for saying this. I, I, I often remember what they say. May fail, I know. Yeah. Who do they think that is? How, yeah. Yeah. How, How can they, they read know? that and not? Who do they think it is? Yeah. They just. I don't fail, fail. Harden hearts. Lou? Don't you think those are different stages of our lives? We see more and more and more of what God has to offer. I know when I was in my 20s, when I first accepted Christ, I was in my early. Mm -hmm. Even though I didn't bathe in the church. Yeah. It yeah. Just and now I feel like he's been so good to me at the times in my life and the things that he has allowed yeah. for me to discover him. Not only that, but to share his love. Right. Right. And I think, you know, he reveals things throughout our lives and it just goes into a deeper chasm you know I mean somehow it just goes deeper and broader and and God just continues to pour forth the fact that he loves us so much that this gospel I mean it's like I was saying last week you know it goes back to Billy Graham and and just that 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 little thing we got to go back he loves us so much it's hard to believe um but we do but as we see it 
and live it out, it just gets more exciting and more real and, and, and more fun. I mean, we just live, live a good life. Um, okay, so we see Paul's salvation. We see his former life advancing in Judaism, persecuting the church, trying to destroy it. And we see him just zealous for these Jewish traditions. Um, so, so in this, we're, we're, we should be understanding that Paul knows about those who are disturbing the Galatians. He's getting what they're going, what's coming against them. He, he, he gets that because that's who he was. That's who he formerly was. Um, so in your homework, we looked at, at Paul, we went back to, uh, let's see, it's page 22, question number three, what Paul says about himself before he was saved. So let's just look at what Paul says about himself. What did he say in Philippians 3, 4, 3, 6? How did he see himself? awful I don't I don't know that he thought he was so awful but he was confident in his flesh yeah. right as a, a religious Jew I mean you hear him say this and you almost are like it's kind of the rich young ruler you're like okay the rich young ruler is you know asking Jesus what do I do and Jesus is like well this and this and this I've done all that I've done all that and you're like really <laughs> really you're, you're you're good with that um, and yet, I mean, those are those scales. I mean, we do think we're so good. And he was a Pharisee of the street. I mean, and that was one of the strictest between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They were very strict. I mean, they were the ones that followed all the rules and did all the things. And, you know, they were in their one straight line and doing everything right. And he says, what? According to law, he was what? Blameless. Blameless. I mean, he just, you know, and he spoke with zeal as a persecutor of the church. So that's who he thought he was as uh, before he came to know what, who God really was and who Jesus was. What did we find out in Acts uh, 7, 54 through uh, 8, 3? What else did we find out? He watched the coach. He watched the coach. He watched, think about this. He was watching Stephen come face to face with Jesus. What did that look like? I mean, really, he's like, okay, this guy, and it, it didn't affect him at the time because he went off and he kept, you know, persecuting the church, but he had just seen somebody see Jesus face to face. What, what a witness that might be. And like Carol said, he was a young man at the time and he approved of this stoning. And yet he went out, I mean, and he was so enraged, you know, that he was dragging people off and putting them in jail. And he's like, um, until, um, well, anyway, so what did it say in 1 Timothy 1, 12 through 16? Well, how did we see him there? He was the worst among sinners. He was a blasphemer. He was a persecutor, uh, an insolent opponent. Um, Paul says in 1 Timothy 1.15, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. One of the problems with the rich young ruler and Paul before he was converted is they didn't see their sin. They couldn't see that they were sinners. They didn't get it. They didn't get it. Um, but exactly, exactly. Lisa, that's all, that's the problem. We don't get it. We don't, we have a hard time getting the good news because we don't think we're that bad. You know, we don't get how far off the mark we don't we don't see ourselves in that black slimy pit stuff i think they knew they were sinners something they did all the sacrifices stuff but they didn't get how 
like you just said, how bad it was. Right. And, was and how far away, away from God they were. How, yeah. There yeah. Was a constant flight of sin. Yeah. Like, yeah. That we couldn't, yeah. yeah. Couldn't, ever get over. couldn't get, yeah. Couldn't get over. And until he reveals that to us, though, we are, are we have scales on our eyes. Exactly. Until his kindness. Exactly. We can't see. Exactly. So what are we learning about God? He's sovereign. He's letting, look how long he let Paul go on in this way and persecute the church. And then how, how was Jesus revealed? By the will of God. I mean, it was like God decided to reveal Jesus to him at a certain time, at a certain point. I thought it was interesting in our homework, you know, that he said, do you regret? And I have a friend whose daughter's like, mom, if you just taught us more about Jesus, you know, I wouldn't have gone through all that I did as a young woman and stuff. And, and, you know, and then she a little bit regrets it, you know, she's like, oh, you know. But, but really, God's got our lives, our, our life. He knows, he knows. And, he, and there's stuff, I mean, this, this may be blasphemous, so take it as a whatever, but there's stuff we have to go through so that when our eyes are open, we realize the truth of the matter. It's like- It can bring you to your knees. It can bring you to your knees. It needs to bring you to your knees. Well, it could even righteousness bring you to your knees. Exactly, exactly. You're right. But not yours. Right. Well, no, but I mean, Paul's righteous. He's like, I'm so righteous. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not, it's not sin, like being immoral, being, yeah, being horrible. It's even, it's even, yeah, our righteousness that I'm so good that, you know, that I don't need to be sick. Yes, good point. Okay, so, um, so in, in First Timothy, 15, let me just grab that. I'm quoting it and I want to, I mean. Okay, 15, it says, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of, of acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. So he's not scared to admit that, but then what it says, but, but. But God, but I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost sinner, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. So, so God allowed Paul's life to be that way, to, to, to be this righteous bully and to, you know, follow all the laws and do all the right things and on and on and on. It was so that Jesus might display his perfect patience. He has such patience with us. He loves us that much that he's patient to wait for us to come when he calls. And even in our falling short as Christians, you know, we, you know, I miss the mark all the time. I'm like, Lord, I am so sorry. He's patient. He gets it. He knows who we are. And he chose willingly to die for us because he loves us that much. Um, he knew that God was going to save us. He's accountable to himself. Exactly. And he knew that God was going to save us. And he was saying, I did something that horrible. Right. Right. And God forgave me. It's sufficient for whatever hole you've gotten yourself in. Exactly. Um, okay. All right. So looking back at Galatians 15, uh, but when he who set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased. It's just you know, we have a hard time with God because it's all kind of when it pleased him to do this. You know, you're like, I want my life to be this way. That's part of our problem is we want to orchestrate our lives and want it to go a certain way. But it was when God was pleased to reveal his son to Paul in order that he may preach him among the Gentiles. 
Um, that's just given us uh, the truth about who God is. That is his God. So we don't want to desert him. And we don't want to desor- distort what he has to say. Because sometimes the reality of our life, you, you kind of want to distort it because you don't want people to know. <laughs> um, and yet God has a plan and a purpose. He had a plan and a purpose for Paul. He's got a plan and a purpose for us. And, and Paul was able to go and, and not necessarily consult uh, the apostles like we've talked about, but, but be confirmed and then, and then go, and then go to Jerusalem in 18, what happens in, in verses 18 through, uh, I don't know what to, where to take you, but what happens in just the scope of verse 18? Um, he goes, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas, and Cephas is just, for whatever reason, Paul doesn't like to call Peter, Peter, he just wants to call him Cephas, and I forget which is like his Hebrew <laughs> name and which is his Greek name, but I think maybe Cephas well, is his Hebrew Peter. name. Peter, yeah. Oh, it's Peter. Okay. So, so he was known as Cephas. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and, and so Paul goes to, to Peter and remains with him for 15 days. Okay. So, you know, he's been three years and now two weeks. It's like, he kind of wants to make a point. It's not, it wasn't like a long time. Peter didn't have time to tell him everything Peter knew about Jesus because Peter had spent three actual years or well they were both actual but but you know in the flesh years with with um jesus so he didn't have time to expound all his knowledge to paul so but in those 14 days they realized like we talked about earlier that their stories lined up they were the same they were the same they had both gotten the same truth from god from jesus yeah yeah and peter and then peter um once again um diane phillips in my night class said peter in second peter i hope i can find it i didn't i didn't write it down but affirms that um that paul has these good words let me see if i can find even peter in my book um sorry i don't know that i can find it but but he says you know paul has these hard words but they are words from god that that god gave him so in the final in the very last bit of second peter and then um the capitations of our love of our lord and salvation just as our beloved brother paul also wrote to you for Yes, yes, yes. Oh, okay. All right. All right. So yeah. So therefore, yeah, final words. Uh, therefore, this is Second Peter 3, 14. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace and count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom. Okay, this is Peter, according to the wisdom given to him as he does in all his letters, when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and un- unstable twist to their own destruction as they do other scripture. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away by the errors of lawless people and lose your own stability. So Peter's saying the same thing that Paul is telling these Galatians, uh, but in it, he's affirming that Paul's words are Peter's. I mean, they're all from God. They're not man. They're not from man. Peter had Paul's life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, yeah, yeah. So those letters, yeah, had gone out, and they were, um, and and Peter was reading them, and Paul was probably reading Peter's as well. So yeah, they all shared their stuff. Um, which is all good. But the gospels weren't written until after. Right, 
right, right, right. There was some, yeah, anyway, that goes beyond what we need to know today. Okay, <laughs> it's, it's, let me just say it's beyond what I know today, so <laughs> we're not going there. <laughs> Okay, so he remains 15 days with Peter and they, you know, they, they're good. Um, but, and then, and then Paul says, but I didn't see any of the other apostles. So, so he's just letting them, he's letting the Galatians know that, that he's been verified. His authority is real. It's from God uh, and it's verified by Peter and he sees James, uh, you know, who was the head of the church in Jerusalem. So he had authority, but that, you know, and, and then, and then Paul's like, you know, and what I'm saying to you before God, I do not lie. So, so he's just, he really wants them to know. He wants us to know that it's kind of like, this, this isn't just a person rattling off, you know, his stuff. This is somebody chosen by God to write this. And proclaim this in the Bible so that we can read it and hold firm to it. And, and truly through um, church history, people have tried to discount, you know, Paul's writings, you know, the, the New Testament and say, well, these were just men and they, you know, just know what man knows, you know, so they're no greater than us. And yet this is just verifying that this is the word of God. And this is what God wants us to know. And then it says, as it ends, it says, then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, which um, y'all look to see where there was, that was. Syria is just north of Palestine and Cilicia, where's Cilicia? That's where Tarsus is. Where was Paul from? Tarsus. So he kind of went back there and he was ministering and um and yet the people the these judaizers probably that he's talking about these people in judea what did they know they didn't know paul they didn't know his name they didn't really know anything about him except for what did they hear what did they hear they knew that he had been a persecutor of their cause and what happened? All of a sudden, they're hearing that this persecutor, this guy that they were scared of because he was just grabbing up people to put him in prison, that now he was preaching. He had changed his whole story. He had changed his whole story. He was preaching the faith that he once tried to destroy. He was a changed man. It's something that I'm kind of just, it took on were no written gospels at this time. They were only verbal. And so they didn't, like, the verbal word of God spread through these very reliable, hand-picked men was critical that they guarded it because there was nothing for the people to go back and flip through and get. And so we just have, you know, put, we have to put ourselves in the cultural context of the time. They are without any Bible. They're without the gospel other than the spoken word. And so you're kind of realizing, like, and, and it's all this no name, to your point. He's just this no name, it's like, what? Oh, that's weird. And then they're moving on, you know, and so they're trying to figure it all out without having the word of God to go back and cross reference. Mm -hmm. the they the had the Old Testament. To get the word of God and all they it. had the Old Testament, and you just have to know. But through the Old Testament, you there's a lot of truth in the Old Testament. And and it verify, I mean, it's back to Isaiah 53. I mean, this is who Jesus is, and this is what you know, and they're 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 testifying, and it's these these men that God called that were witnesses of who Jesus was, and they were they were they were losing their life proclaiming these things and people were seeing these people so sure that they saw a risen Jesus they were so sure about that they were like you know what death no big deal because I know what I know and I can't 
say well, anything different. Well, <coughs> honestly, we're still doing it in denominational Christianity. You know, we're saying we're making it into a checklist. Do this, do this, say this, now say this, now come over here, we'll do this, okay, now you're Christian. And somehow the personal relationship with Jesus is gone. Mm -hmm. And so we focus more on church traditions of denomination. Maybe people that we talk to know more about their church traditions and the rituals associated with it than they know about Jesus. Right. And yet they firmly believe that he was Jesus, even though he said the greatest thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, while we're slamming the Judaizers, right, you know, right, they're, they're cultural Jews. This has been going on for hundreds of years, and they're trying to reconcile this understanding of Jesus with everything else they've been taught. Right. So, you know, Paul's painting them maliciously, but I don't, I wonder, I question how malicious. They really were. Right, they're right. Barbara, good point. Them. Barbara's saying she's wondering how malicious these Judaizers are. And they're they're not. They're thinking, they're bringing, you know, this was good. God had this plan. I mean, you think of, and circumcision really was a promise to Abraham. You remember I said, I mean, it's not really part of the Mosaic law. It is, but it isn't. I mean, it was the promise. It was the the <clears throat> sign of the covenant that God made with Abraham. So it preceded the law. Uh, and yet it was, it was one of those things. So to, to Barbara's point, you know, then all of a sudden, sometimes we kind of, well, we fight over baptism. We've got Baptists here, we've got Presbyterians here, and we baptize in completely different ways. And we have completely different concepts of what Baptist baptism signifies and, and, and all that. And we fight over that. And it doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It that's, that's the thing. And we get so caught up and to Barbara's point, we just get, then we, then we, we grab hold of that. We're like, Oh, well, I can't be your friend. I can't, I can't, you know, y'all got the wrong thing going here. And it's not, it's, it's not malicious. It's just that this is how I believe and, and this is right. And yet it, it, Paul is saying, you're missing the point. You are missing the point. You know, he and said, because he, he so willing to die on that hill for certain things, for not just that, but so many yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. So many, and so many things. Yeah, yeah. What Jesus did for us, that he did that for us. He did that for us. Um, but Sarah, the flip side of that, just so briefly, is that I, I agree with everything you said. The flip side of that is when you meet someone who knows Jesus, it doesn't matter where they come from, what they look like. It doesn't matter because you can pinpoint right then and there that Jesus is their king. Yes. yes. And then everything else just goes away. Yes. Right? Yes. And so I, I yes. go, that's the fabulous part about the good news. Yes. None of this stuff matters. Let's not get caught up in that because when you meet someone who is the king, you go, oh, this is woo. Yeah. And, 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 uh, so, and, exactly. and we talked about in here and back in Acts the, the different traditions and, and like the circumcision. And that's not, I mean, yes, as an element of the Judaizer, but what Paul is saying here is I am astonished at how quickly we turn to another gospel. So if we look at everything we're studying here, what is the gospel? I think that these other things, the traditions and the, you know, the how you baptize and all that are peripheral to this, but it, here in this message, He's saying, don't turn to another gospel. Right. Don't look to something else as salvation. Right, right. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And they're turning, they're deserting. Who are they deserting? It's not what they're deserting. Jesus. God. 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 They're deserting God, it says. Um, the gospel is about grace. Yes. Right. Right. 
Exactly, exactly. We looked at grace uh, in our homework. Let me see if I can find page four of your homework. Um, we looked at cross references to uh, connecting God's grace to the gospel. What did you find in John 1, 16 through 17? Page, day four, day four, page 21. Sorry. Page, day four, page 21. We looked at cross references. So John 1, 16 through 17, what did it say? Uh, that, that from his fullness, we have received grace upon grace, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth. So the law, you know, the law is God's justice. We, we have a hard time because God is just, but, and it's good. It's like I mentioned before, the law is good. It shows us the character of God. It tells us who God is. The bad thing about it is it's a magnifying glass on our lives and it reveals to us where we miss and where we don't line up with God. Um, so the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. What about Ephesians 4.10? That because of his great love for us, he made us alive together with Christ by grace. Unmerited, unearned favor. We've been saved. That's the good news. We don't deserve it. We didn't earn it. It's just his gracious, merciful love poured out on us that saves us. And it's him sending Jesus into that dark, slimy pit to pull us out. Why? Because he loves us. Because he loves us. We just have to get our arms around his love for us. And that's, you know, I think Satan and the world just want to tell us he doesn't love us. He doesn't love us. It's a gift. It's a gift. It's not. There's it's a gift. We can do. Exactly. Nothing can I bring. Only Except to the cross me. I cling. Um, Okay, and it's this grace that we've been saved through what? Right. Through faith, through believing. And that's where we're going to see Galatians walk into because as, as we're, it's faith alone is that we're believing faith alone. But what happens with faith? It's not alone. It changes us. Look at what happened to Paul. It changed him dramatically. He was a completely different person. They, they, you know, heard about this persecutor who was completely changed. And he wasn't doing it out of, you know, I've got to do this or I'm not going to get, I mean, that's how he started out. I mean, you know, I'm doing this uh, for God. And yet it, it, it totally changed. And he's doing it because he knows how loved he is. All right. And then Titus 2, uh, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-control. See there, and, and that's, that's part of it is, you know, we, we get to this freedom and, and we're free and yet the grace of God should compel us to um, be crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives. It's because I realize how much he loves me. And it's worth crucifying this flesh that wants these crazy desires that God doesn't like. Um, okay, and then and on page 24 of our homework, we looked at Ephesians 1, uh, 1 through 8, which says God lavished his grace upon believers. Blessing, redemption, forgiveness, it all comes from his lavish uh, from his lavishing this grace upon us um, in salvation. All right, so how does this gospel that we're hearing Paul preach compare to what we're hearing today? Do we know what true salvation is? Do we know the truth about God and how much he loves us? That he is um, omnipotent. 
he's, he's just all powerful. He's omniscient, omniscient. He, he sees all things. He knows all things. He knows about what uh, Putin is doing in Russia. And he knows that oppression. And he knows, he knows, he knows, he knows all these, uh, a man, a uh, missionary got up in, in our church Sunday and um, he was just saying, there's more slavery today than there's ever been in the world. When we think slavery is over with, and he said, there are more people enslaved today than there were you know, back in the Civil War when we were so outraged by it. Um, so life is going on, but God knows. And God is omnipresent. He is everywhere in our lives. Um, and God sent Jesus. God sent Jesus. It just seems so long ago. And yet, 2022 years ago, he, Jesus pulled us out of that slimy dark pit because of his great love for us, his great love for all people, even those who seem violently opposed and heading in the wrong direction. Um, what is God's call for our life? Let me just end with, once again, I got into this commentary, Philip Reichen, and I just loved what he had to say. Um, see how far back I can go. Uh, okay. Um, we are going to find out in this Galatian study that we are justified. We are saved by grace alone, by faith alone. I've just said all this um, on the basis of Christ alone. So Barbara was just talking about how it's kind of the same today as it was back then. And truly the Reformation um, happen because the Catholic Church had just started, you know, putting laws and rules. And if you if do this, and if you'll pay us that, and if you'll do your penance, you'll be closer to God. And so um, Martin Luther just got oppressed by that. And he really came to save, saving faith as a monk, trying to do everything he could to do the right thing. He came to saving faith while he was studying, and actually, I think he was teaching Galatians. So anyway, so we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, on the basis of Christ alone, the gospel, the true gospel. That does not, that doesn't include circumcision, circumcision <coughs> baptism, we've just talked about this, doesn't even include the Lord's Supper, though it's a, you know, it's an important, it's important for us to remember. God set up those, um, what sacrifice were they called? Sac sacraments, sacraments, sorry. <laughs> sacraments for us to remember and to, to remind us, to take us back to the truth of it all. They're important in that regard, but it, to Elizabeth's point, they're not salvific. They're, they don't save us. They just help us stay in the right place, in the right state, <laughs> you know, the right mindset, really. So, um, but we will find through Galatians, as we walk out in, that, in this faith, in this belief, as we refuse to desert God, as we refuse to listen to a different gospel, that we are saved by the gracious, merciful love of God, um, as we've seen in Paul's life, faith is never alone. God appointed Paul to do much for him to suffer. We saw in Acts, he suffered much for God and to be his witness. So Philip Ryken tells this story. A university student in Vietnam decided to become a Christian, a choice that proved to be very costly. He fell out of favor, he fell out of favor with the communist leaders. And as a result, he was turned down for a job as a lecturer and forced to perform menial labor. At first, the young man was very angry, not only with God, but also with his parents who had raised him in the church. You work only for the church, he complained. Why don't you help me? His father had a simple answer. He said, you are for God. In other words, 
you know, you do not live for yourself anymore, my son. You belong to God. You cannot, oh, is what I have. I have no, you cannot do something and seek some great position for yourself. You must receive your place in life as a gift from God. To be a Christian is a wonderful thing. We've been given such a gracious, wonderful gift. And it's a free gift that we can't pay for, that we can't earn. And yet it's costly. It's costly. Our lives have to change. We have to crucify our flesh um, <coughs> because it doesn't walk in sync with God. And yet we should desire that. Every Christian story is different, but the storyline is always the same. God chose you and called you to faith. He revealed his son to your heart. Then he gave you a particular place to serve. Do we know, do you know that God has called you and that he has a particular place for you to serve wherever it is? It doesn't, you don't have to go out and you don't really have. Thank you, Denise, for going out and doing these things, but really just being a minister in your own neighborhood among the people that you see every day is where God has put you for right now. Believe God's love, trust God lo God's love, live in the grace and the peace that comes only from God. Don't quickly desert the grace of God because of troubling people or a distorted gospel. Know God's gospel of grace, share God's gospel of love, and extend God's gospel of mercy to others. Okay. I'm going to turn off the recorder. <laughs>